Great. Thank you so much for um, sticking around till the last day. So I'll be talking today about optical control, uh, optically programmable entanglement for multi-mode quantum metrology. Um, and I thought I'd start with sort of a couple of examples of um, motivation for my, why one might care about this type of work. And so um, particularly for this audience, maybe you're interested in um, something like uh, comparing clocks for tests of fundamental physics. This is a picture from the lab of Shimon Kolkowitz um, uh, doing precision measurements of um, gravitational redshifts with an array of atomic clocks. Um, in sort of a broader uh, quantum sensing community, you might be interested in, for example, um, imaging magnetic fields. Here's a picture from the lab of Ben Lev using cold atoms near a superconductor um, to probe magnetic domains. Um, so broadly speaking, these are some of the kind of tasks where one might want to use atomic quantum sensors. Um, and in general, if you have sort of n uncorrelated atoms, the precision, as you have certainly heard this week, will be limited by, by quantum projection noise, and entanglement can let us get higher precision in fixed time with finite atom number. Um, and so that is an area that is already well explored. This is sort of um, my version of the plot that James showed you yesterday. Um, it's certainly incomplete, but gives kind of a sense of um, the range of different experiments that are exploring um, entanglement enhanced um, measurements operating somewhere between that standard quantum limit where projection noise uh, limits the precision um, and this fundamental Heisenberg limit. And so there's a range of different platforms um, where um, some of the um, strongest metrological gains, for example, have been achieved with atoms in optical cavities in the type of platform James um, told you about yesterday. Um, uh, uh, Ultra, uh, collisions in Bose-Einstein condensates, um, and very recently interactions among Rydberg atoms have kind of been um, also added to this to this plot. So there's um, uh, really been success not only in sort of accessing precision beyond the standard quantum limit, but also applying this to applications, including optical atomic clocks and atom interferometers. Um, and broadly speaking, there's um, you know various um, directions you actually might care about going in this plot. This is the direction of absolute precision, many atoms plus gains beyond the standard quantum limit from entanglement. Um, but there are also actually some directions that aren't even on this plot. And so I want to mention actually the experiments I'll talk about today, um, they might not look particularly impressive on this plot. Um, they're just starting to push beyond the standard quantum limit. Um, and so, you know, why should you care? The reason is actually we're pushing in a new direction of having not just a single large entangled ensemble, but actually multi-mode entanglement um, which is um, with a high degree of optical control. Um, and so uh, that's to warn you, don't, don't look too much at the absolute numbers, but look at the new direction that we're pushing, right? So um, why might you want to push in new directions? So sort of, you know, the textbook task that you might sort of think about in quantum metrology is I have a single quantity that I want to measure. Um, maybe it's a global magnetic field. Maybe I'm trying to measure time and a clock. Um, and so my resource for that is a single collective entangled state. Um, but in reality, there's a number of different figures of merit you actually might care about in quantum sensing. So you might care about spatial resolution. You might care not just how precise is my sensor, but what is its dynamic range? Um, what is the measurement bandwidth? And so in general, if you want to sort of improve some of these other figures of merit, um, it could be valuable to have access to, to multi-mode entanglement in some form. Um, and so that's going to be, um, that's the goal in the experiments I'll talk about today. Um, I'll actually talk about two different physical platforms. Um, one where we actually use local interactions generated by coupling atoms to Rydberg states. So sort of these are interactions with a few micron range that can be used to generate um, squeezing within ensembles um, in an array. Um, and then I'll also talk about um, the uh, non-local interactions mediated by photons in an optical cavity. Um, similar to the type of platform you heard about from James uh, yesterday, but really focusing again on having an array of atomic ensembles where we can have some control over the spatial structure of entanglement. Okay, so um, let's, let's start with this first platform. So here the idea is um, we have essentially an array of about 10 little clouds of atoms, a few hundred atoms per trap. Um, and we have the ability to essentially, um, in order to generate entanglement, we need to introduce some kind of an interaction. Um, and the way that we do that, um, in our case, we have cesium atoms. We have essentially um, two, um, uh, the kind of, we, we have essentially a, a cesium clock, which lives in the, the hyperfine states here. Um, but we can couple one of those clock states to a Rydberg state off resonantly to sort of mix in some inter long range interacting character. So this is nice because we have interactions that are on when the light is on and off, and you have a nice non interacting system when the light is off. 
Um, uh, and one also has kind of nice, easy control of the hyperfine spin with microwaves. Um, so the picture you can have in mind is when we turn on the light um, that dresses one of these clock states, if I look at a level scheme for two atoms and I look at their energy as a function of distance, if the atoms are far apart, the, they see some AC Stark shift from this dressing light. Um, but if they come close to each other, that Stark shift is suppressed essentially by the impossibility of exciting two atoms. And so that gives rise to some kind of an interaction potential that's flat out to essentially a critical distance where the detuning of this light matches the Rydberg-Rydberg interaction. Um, and in our system, that's a few micron range. So um, one way that this interaction manifests, and this is something we looked at already a couple of years ago, um, if you look at sort of um, different spin polarized states in the system and you vary kind of the tilt, how many atoms are in that spin up state, which is dressed, one sees essentially a tilt dependent spin precision, precession, which is coming about from the fact that sort of neighboring atoms in the spin up state suppress that AC start shift. And so this looks a lot like a Hamiltonian you've already heard about in this, this conference, the so-called one axis twisting Hamiltonian um, that sort of twists um, uh, the sort of twists this block sphere and can in principle give rise to squeezing if one looks at the quantum fluctuations, right? So something that starts as a round uncertainty res distribution should get squeezed into something, twisted into something that's squeezed. Um, so it's a little bit different from the sort of canonical version of this Hamiltonian where every atom talks to every other. We have some short range interaction. Um, but the potential benefit of that is that it means that one can sort of really have these locally controlled interactions and make an array of independent squeezed states. Um, so potential challenges are, again, this isn't quite the idealized all-to-all -all interaction. Um, and an additional challenge is that actually a number of experiments um, applying this Rydberg dressing approach had sort of suffered from uh, multi-body loss processes that limited the coherence. So this is just one slide um, to put, you know, a couple of years of hard work um, <laughs> up here to say that um, one of the sort of challenges in this approach was dealing with minimizing any sort of multi-body loss process. If you have um, you know, 1% loss, um, and it's a Poisson process, then that actually won't um, uh, immediately de degrade your ability to squeeze. But if, in our, as in our case, you see atoms lost in groups of, let's say, 20, um, that could be a problem. So it turns out that applying this light in short pulses, um, which are shaped to be adiabatic, was very important to actually making this process coherent. Um, and that allowed us to actually see um, squeezing of the quantum fluctuations. So here's um, a measurement of essentially noise as a function of angle um, by which we rotate this state about itself, and one sees the noise, um, uh, or in particular the squeezing parameter, which tells us the noise to signal ratio um, dip below the standard quantum limit, telling us that in fact we have um, realized in, this is focusing on sort of one of these clouds, seen enhanced sensitivity due to entanglement. Um, and I should emphasize this is actually came sort of around the same time as two other results that were the first to use these Rydberg interactions to squeeze. These other two results are in um, arrays of single atoms. Um, ours is in clouds of, of hundreds of atoms. Um, and um, so there's uh, sort of, I would say, these are all kind of complementary experiments um, that are starting to use these local interactions to generate entanglement. Um, one has been in the setting of an optical tweezer clock, and actually this stroboscopic dressing approach that we've demonstrated could potentially um, be applied in that optical clock setting as well. So, um, okay. So one can also look, that was looking at a single ensemble, one can also sort of look at this whole array. It turns out in our experiment, we had some sort of inhomogeneous profile of the light that's inducing the squeezing, and um, that's kind of neat because it lets you sort of in a single shot look at the dependence on the intensity of the light, and one sees um, sort of where the light is strongest, um, the squeezing is strongest, um, and um, this matches actually quite well what we would expect from a model of this so-called one-axis twisting Hamiltonian where we um, pretend that the system um, it has sort of um, a number of sort of a collective spin whose size is governed by the number of interacting neighbors, which is in our system, there's about 200 atoms per cloud, but they interact in groups of about 13. Um, okay, and importantly, this is getting better with increasing laser intensity, and so we think there's a direction to actually, um, so far the squeezing is sort of uh, a 20% effect, but um, there's room to push this um, by, by cranking up the laser intensity, and so that's, um, there's 
directions for optimizing that um, just by sort of technical improvements, but also at a fundamental level, ultimately one will be limited um, by sort of the finite range of the interactions. And so once one hits that point, there's some interesting opportunities for sort of op really truly optimizing the squeezing one can get with these local interactions um, com by combining sort of these optically optical control of the interactions with the ability to, for example, um, do any sort of spin rotation just with a microwave field. Um, so in some past experiments looking at mean field dynamics, we've shown we can realize a transverse field Ising type of interaction in this system. And it turns out that those two ingredients, the interactions plus a transverse field, can allow you to actually spread correlations beyond the range of the interaction. Anna Maria Ray has done nice work on this, thinking specifically about this Rydberg dress system. Um, there's been work from um, Raphael Kaupert, who, who I think might be here, um, uh, thinking about how one can optimally control interactions in a transverse field um, to, to access um, uh, maximally squeezed states. So these are directions that could be pursued in the future. Um, in terms of sort of how one might apply this in metrology, um, one sort of great application for having not just one entangled state, but an array of entangled states um, or, or an array of independent ensembles is that it can allow for simultaneously getting high precision and high dynamic range. So for example, one can sort of do a coarse readout with one ensemble of the phase um, that's been acquired, um, uh, which could be you know, the phase due to some large magnetic field if it's a magnetometer or the um, laser phase if it's a clock. So you can do a coarse readout plus feedback to the other ensembles in order to enhance um, um, that combination of high precision and high dynamic range. And that's been shown um, to, re to enable a Heisenberg scaling um, for clocks. And so that's um, an exciting direction to take this control of, of squeezing in an array. OK, so that's um, all enabled by this ability to have these local interactions that generate multiple independent squeeze states. Um, again, the challenge is, is that they don't naturally give rise to sort of um, large scale entanglement um, uh, in sort of a scalable system size. And so for naturally getting sort of massively parallel entanglement of, of many atoms, um, a cavity is a really nice way to go because it gives you this sort of non-local connectivity. If I have a cavity mode that's focused over a millimeter long region, I can have all the atoms in that millimeter long region talk to each other. Um, and so um, the sort of, to get really a concrete picture of how the atoms can talk to each other, um, here's a cartoon of, for example, a cavity-mediated spin exchange interaction that can be the building block for generating entanglement. So here, I, if you had just two atoms, you can imagine a process where um, the right atom um, absorbs a photon from some drive field, emits into the cavity, um, flips its spin, and the left atom absorbs that photon and in turn flips its spin. Um, and uh, that can get, generate some kind of spin exchange processes mediated by photons that are scattered within this cavity. This is the building block of the sorensen lomer interaction, which I mentioned because someone said I get an extra minute if I do that. So, <laughs> um, so uh, great. So th th this, is, this is nice because when I scale this up to many, I can efficiently sort of entangle um, all of these atoms in a massively parallel way. Um, but it doesn't give a natural way of having like con control of the spatial structure of entanglement in an array, which I said was something we would love to be able to do. Um, and so in order to sort of address that challenge, um, we set up a system where we really do have um, uh, sort of clumps of, of atoms, an array of, of clouds of atoms that we can actually independently control. So we have sort of two ingredients. We have, um, so it, each of these clouds has some thousands of atoms. And we have um, one ingredient, which is that we can drive the cavity to generate all-to-all -all interactions. Um, but we can also locally address in order to generate, uh, to, to have some spatial control. So we can do all-to-all -all interactions, and we can do local spin rotations. Um, and this is going to turn out to be actually a very flexible toolbox for programming the structure of entanglement. Um, OK. So in particular, the idea is when we drive the cavity, that induces this Raman process, where a photon um, goes into the cavity as a spin is flipped. Um, and the two pairs of this, pro a pair of these processes um, gives spin exchange interactions. Or in our case, um, actually, we work with the spin one ground state of rubidium. And a typical way that we um, initialize the system is to start with all the atoms in the m equals zero state and turn on the light. 
Um, and um, that induces a process of pair creation, where, for example, two atoms in the zero state can turn into a plus one minus one pair. If you're more from the optics community, this might look to you like a four-wave mixing type of a process. Um, uh, if you're from an ultra-cold gas community, this might remind you of um, sp uh, spin mixing in Bose-Einstein condensates, where collisional interactions can give you these plus one minus one pairs. Um, and that's been well established as a way of generating a form of uh, squeezing known as spin pneumatic squeezing, and I'll say more about that in a second. Um, so just to, this is sort of a cartoon for two atoms. In our system, we have many atoms, and so if you take this array of many atoms and you turn on the light and you look at the subsequent um, populations in these three internal states, um, one sees that, um, one thing you'll see is this is sort of each pixel here is the site of the array, and you'll see that when there are more atoms in the minus one state, there are also more atoms in the plus one state, um, this looks kind of like it um, matches what I said about this formation of correlated atom pairs. Um, but we'd like to look more closely and see, is this really um, generating entanglement? And so it turns out um, a way to do that is to visualize the dynamics on sort of a generalized collective block sphere. Um, so in particular, the Hamiltonian for this system, this kind of um, F plus, F minus process, I can equivalently write that as an Fx squared plus Fy squared Hamiltonian. That's the interaction. Um, and there's an additional term I'll mention that's a quadratic Zeeman shift. Um, I've written it here in terms of these collective spin operators and also some collective quadrupole operator because these are spin one atoms. Um, the really important thing to know is that um, essentially you can think of this um, much like a block sphere um, with um, uh, where this fx squared term generates an fx dependent precession about the x-axis, um, which gives rise to these twisting dynamics. There's another copy of this block sphere that has Fy. It'll do the same thing there. We'll focus on this one. OK, so this is a way um, uh, that where if we start with a state that's polarized along this axis I called QZZ, which means all the atoms are in the zero state, um, we should get some squeezing of the quantum fluctuations on this generalized block sphere. And um, the important thing is we can sort of measure fluctuations along the x direction, and we can do any rotation. Um, and indeed, we can map out that um, these, these dynamics, in fact, give rise to squeezing. OK, um, so this shows a way of generating global entanglement via these all-to-all -all interactions. Um, but now we'd like to start actually combining that with the ability to locally probe and manipulate the atoms. So one question we can ask is, um, could I also generate sort of local squeezing um, in this array? Um, you know, similar to what I did earlier with, the, with our local interactions. Can we do that in this cavity? So we can ask, is there squeezing within mode A or mode B alone? Um, and, and if you do the simplest experiment of just applying this global squeezing operation um, and you ask about this squeezing parameter within an individual spatial mode, um, what you'll see is um, the squeezing is degraded, and that shouldn't really surprise you. It's like I you know, took a squeeze state if it were light. It's like I took my squeeze state and put it on a beam splitter, and of course the squeezing will be degraded um, because we've thrown away the information in the correlations between A and B. Um, if we want to actually, uh, so there's a trick we can play to disentangle the subsystems, which is apply a local pi rotation to half of the system, to say, let's say subsystem B, and then do another global squeezing operation. And now, essentially, these two squeezing operations or these two entangling operations cancel um, for entanglement between the subsystems, um, but they enhance each other for squeezing within the subsystems. And so at the end of the day, this gives us two independently squeezed um, subsystems. OK, so we have sort of this tool for generating global entanglement. Um, and, in, incidentally, this global entanglement plus a local rotation could also allow you to change between sensitivity to the global field or sensitivity to a gradient. Um, but um, by combining, using the local rotation for disentangling, we can also have an array of squeeze states. That's great if you want to sort of have enhanced resolution um, for some spatially varying field. Um, and maybe you'd like to even go a step further than that, though, and start to have control, really uh, flexible control over the correlations between these ensembles. Um, and that could be interesting um, uh, for a range of, of tasks, including a multi-parameter estimation. And I'll say a bit more about that um, in a moment. Um, so generally, what we asked ourselves is, um, let's say you give me a certain graph of entanglement that you'd like, um, a certain structure of correlations indicated by these red lines. Is there some general procedure for me to actually make that graph? Um, 
And so, uh, so to be very concrete about this, we asked the question, can we make a class of state known as a graph state, um, which actually these are, um, as an aside, kind of known as universal resources for measurement-based quantum computation. Um, but I think that's sort of an indication of the power of this form of entanglement. If you can make this type of state, you could subsequently do any computation by local operations and measurements, and that might also mean it's a good starting point more generally for quantum control. Um, and the idea is that this graph is sort of a, a pictorial representation of the structure of entanglement between, um, generally these can be defined either for qubits or for, um, uh, or for continuous variables, like, like oscillators, and it turns out our ensembles of atoms are gonna be more like these continuous variables. But just to sort of like define what we mean by these graph states, if anybody has more of a quantum information background, um, these are one way to think of these as it's what you get if you have an array of qubits and you apply a controlled Z gate on each edge. Um, and that generates a certain structure of correlations. In our case, we're going to think of these um, ensembles that live on this collective block sphere that we're characterizing by some Gaussian fluctuations. We can think of these as approximately like the X and P of a harmonic oscillator. And there, what a graph state means, it's one way to think about it operationally is it's the state you would generate if you apply um, an interaction X, I, X, J between every pair that's connected by an edge. Um, and in terms of the structure of correlations, it means that P on you know, site I will be correlated with X on the, on the neighboring site. So that's how these states are defined. And now in the cavity, we don't really have a natural way of turning on interactions between particular pairs. Um, and so you might ask, you know, is there a natural way to do this um, using just the global interactions that we have access to? So um, it turns out there is a nice way to do this. And, and the way to see this is essentially we can write down the, this graph of entanglement that we'd like as a matrix, and we can diagonalize that matrix. So here's a simple case, this two mode, um, this is essentially an EPR type entangled state where X on the left should be correlated with P on the right and vice versa. Um, this would be the matrix specifying that graph. And if I want to make that state, um, I'll find the eigenmodes. In this case, it's the symmetric and the anti-symmetric mode of this system. Those are the modes that I should squeeze. And it turns out the eigenvalues of the matrix will specify the quadratures in which those modes should be squeezed. So this is a prescription for making this state just by the types of interactions we can realize in the cavity. So for this EPR state, um, what we do, we apply this global squeezing operation, which would squeeze the symmetric mode. Then we can apply a local rotation that essentially converts the symmetric mode to the anti-symmetric mode, apply another, um, apply a phase space rotation that picks out the squeezed quadrature of the mode we squeezed, and then apply a second squeezing operation so that now both the symmetric and the anti-symmetric mode are squeezed. Um, so uh, that gives rise to um, these curves when I look at the squeezing parameter as a function of rotation angle. And in fact, this matches the prescription that we got by diagonalizing, which was that we should squeeze um, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric modes in opposite quadratures. Um, based on that, one can also actually write down a witness for entanglement between these two subsystems. Um, and that witness for entanglement is essentially, it's the product of uncertainties um, of the symmetric mode in one quadrature and the anti-symmetric mode in the orthogonal quadrature. Why is that a good witness for entanglement? Um, so it turns out you can think of this as asking, is it possible for me to use, um, to predict both quadratures, X and P, in subsystem A to better than the standard quantum limit based on information that I get from measurements of subsystem B, right? So if the two subsystems are, are uh, unentangled, there's no way for me to, you know, have a state that simultaneously that lets you predict X or P to better than the standard quantum limit. But if you have entanglement between the subsystems, there's this nice feature that actually the sum of the X's and the difference of the P's are commuting observables. And so that actually means that if I measure either X or P in subsystem B, I can perfectly predict in principle um, X or P in subsystem A. So there's no uncertainty bound um, between the sum of the x's and the difference of the p's. Um, and so hence, um, that product of uncertainties, x in the symmetric mode, p in the anti-symmetric mode, is something that obeys this inequality for separable states, but can violate the inequality for um, entangled states. And that actually feature is, some, that feature is something that um, can actually be useful for if I want to simultaneously sense displacements in two non-commuting variables. Um, so there's a wonderful paper um, called uh, Evading Quantum Mechanics, 
um, by Tsang and Caves um, that pointed this out. Um, and there's been um, experiments exploring this idea in the, in the group of um, Eugene Polzik, for example, um, by having the two subsystems be a spin ensemble and a mechanical oscillator. Um, so this can be a, a powerful resource for letting you do things that might feel like they shouldn't be possible in quantum metrology. Okay, so that's that entanglement witness. Um, we can also demonstrate a stronger condition known as EPR steering, um, uh, which is a resource for quantum teleportation. Um, but now we'd love to also scale this up, right? And so here's an example where we've scaled this up from two ensembles to um, the, the to four ensembles. Um, we chose a square as a nice sort of target state to ask, can we generate this structure of entanglement? Um, and again, you just diagonalize this target correlation matrix, you get a set of collective modes you should squeeze in certain quadratures, um, and based on these squeezing curves, we can reconstruct the, the correlations and they match um, what we set out to do quite nicely. One can also really directly, with local control, measure these different so-called nullifiers that say, you know, P on site I is correlated with the X's on the neighboring sites, um, and these are all um, from, from these values. Ideally, these would all be zero. In practice, they're something, um, <laughs> so, some number that we can measure and compare to a bound on, uh, it turns out if these are all less than 0.94, there's no way to cut the graph into its subsystems, and so we're able to show, um, to show that spatial entanglement in the system. Okay, so what can you do with this? So one, so one thing is you might want to scale this up further. So how does it scale? Um, so the cool thing is actually, you know, naively you might think to make an M node graph, maybe you would need sort of M squared operations to connect different nodes. But it turns out just these M collective squeezing operations on the eigenmodes suffice to generate any graph. And the rate of that squeezing is actually collectively enhanced by the cavity. Um, there are certain classes of graphs that are sort of more natural to make. So example, if you want to make a translation invariant graph, then the eigenmodes are going to be spin wave modes. And to cycle through those, you can actually, you don't even need to do arbitrary local addressing. You can just apply a magnetic, magnetic field gradient. Um, this actually connects to some past work we've done where we say, um, if I want to generate a particular interaction Hamiltonian, I can really use a magnetic, uh, sort of with some spatial structure, I can use a magnetic field gradient to cycle through different spin wave modes that couple to the cavity at different times. Um, and by pulsing on the light of a given strength at a, at a different time, I can actually control essentially the dispersion relation for magnons in the system, or equivalently, so the waveform in time gives energy as a function of spin wave momentum, equivalently the frequency spectrum gives um, the couplings as a function of distance. And we've actually been able to use this method to generate interactions with a whole host of different um, graphs that we can program by the waveform of the drive field. So we can make this 1D chain act like a ring. We can make it look like a Mobius strip. Um, this was so far programmable interactions, but um, this can be generalized now to actually really programmable entanglement um, using this um, language of, of the gra and formalism for the graph states. Okay. So there's a number of different directions this can go. Um, what I won't talk about today is, um, you know, you applying this toolbox to tackle quantum gravity from a simulation side, but that's something we've um, worked on. Can one see something that looks like gravity emerging from the structure of quantum correlations um, in this system with programmable interactions? Um, so that's a route to studying quantum gravity um, viewed as viewed through AES CFT duality. Um, um, from the side of quantum simulation rather than precision measurement. Um, but what I want, if I have like a couple more minutes, I'll just say a little bit more about the prospects in, in quantum metrology. Um, and so here, you know, this EPR, these EPR pairs um, enable these back action evading measurements, right? So it's a way to simultaneously sense perturbations in um, non-commuting observables. Um, I think there's lots of interesting um, questions about sort of whether the more complex graphs also give you a metrological gain and for what tasks. Um, I also want to mention that this scheme generalizes. So, um, you know, I focused on spin ensembles, but you could also imagine multimode optomechanical systems. There's been a lot of progress in having, for example, control over um, nanospheres um, in their ground state. So if you want to do force sensing, these could be ingredients um, in multimode optomechanics. Okay, so in the last kind of minute, I just want to say a bit more about this um, direction and back action evasion in an experiment that we're kind of currently working on. So the idea um, is something we would love to be able to do is image simultaneously both quadratures of a magnetic field. Um, so this could be vector magnetometry or two quadratures of an AC field. And the point is here, there's really a constraint on, you know, I want a certain spatial resolution. And there's also a limited number of atoms 
per pixel, just given by the density I can reasonably have. And so without entanglement, that will enforce how precisely I can measure sort of these two different, let's say, components of a vector field um, in a given pixel. Um, but if I had an array of these EPR pairs of ensembles, um, then I could have sort of my sensor spins, where I'm trying to do this, this quantum-enhanced measurement, and some reference spins, which we could put in magnetic field insensitive states. They could be far away. And now we could apply this system to simultaneously detect um, sort of both quadratures of, of, the, the, uh, of the spin um, in the sensor region by using the entangle entanglement with the reference spins. One challenge in this is that one needs, in order to get simultaneous information about X and P, to do non-local measurements of these observables, the sum of the X's and the difference of the P's. Um, and I just want to mention my student actually came up with a very clever scheme to instead actually map these non-local observables onto local quantities by a second period of interaction that basically takes the, you know, X, some of the X's and maps it onto something that one can detect locally um, with measurements in just a single quadrature. And so one key ingredient here is the ability to generate an entangled state via interactions, but then actually use the interactions again to detect the entangled state. We haven't done that yet with the EPR states, um, but we have some preliminary results on doing this um, just for the global squeeze state on sort of um, squeezing and then again using the cavity-based uh, interactions to amplify the signal and to help us detect it. Um, and so um, this we're excited to now apply to this simultaneous sensing or imaging even of these non-commuting observables. Um, with that, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to say, um, just remind you, I showed you sort of tools for generating local squeezing with local interactions um, in an array. Um, or for having programmable non-local entanglement using these non-local interactions in the cavity. And none of this would be possible without this awesome team of students and postdocs. So with that, I'll thank you all. And thank you, Monica. Questions? Anna? Beautiful talk, Monica, very exciting. So I have one question. So the, you are generating the, the two mode squeezing by using kind of an icing interaction with the pi poles in the middle, yes, to, to suppress. Yeah, you can think of it as an icing interaction in this kind of spin nematic space, yes, right? Yes. It's actually a spin exchange type. But, but what yeah. about if you start with up down and you create the pairs with the two, I mean, if you have with up down, you can create the pairs uh, simultaneously. I mean, you can create a squeeze the two quadratures at the same time, yes? Like what you do in typically to mode the squeezing the A daga, B daga, yeah. you are going to have the plus and the minus. In. So you're, let me just understand, so your A dagger and your B dagger, yeah, they are the two spatial modes? Or, uh, yes, sorry. so if you have yeah. down here, you have one excitation, yeah. this is A, yeah. and if you have up here, the other excitation is B, and you create the pairs correlated, and you create, you entangle the two quadratures simultaneously, yeah. the yeah. plus and the minus, but in opposite direction. The, I think it's like I, generative formula makes it reverses. Um, I'm just trying to think, because, okay, so there's one thing that's happening, which is we're generating correlated pairs in the internal states, but you're not asking about that. You're saying I have just this, effectively, at the end of the day, I have this twisting-type Hamiltonian that generates global interactions. Everything is global. Everything yeah, is, is global, exactly. but, but I yeah. think they, because you already break the symmetry, you have half down, half up. Yeah. In there, so the excitations on one part is up, the oxidation of the other is down, and you are going to generate it at the same time. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think what I, what I would say is... You generate the two squeeze quadratures and two anti squeeze quadratures at the same, with the same operation. So Oh, oh, you're starting. So we. Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say is like, I don't think that changes anything about the spatial structure of the entanglement, right? Just, well, but it's just simultaneously. Sort of it's simultaneously you do the two at the same time. Well, but we can then. Yeah, maybe we should talk about it offline. Okay. I guess I would say we're, we're, we've, what we've been focused on is how do we control the spatial structure of entanglement. Everything we're doing is sort of agnostic, actually, to the method of squeezing. It's sort of the general picture is you have some way of making global entanglement. It could be a QND measurement. Um, it, you know, it could be one axis mm -hmm. twisting it. Um, and, but how do you combine that then with this local control to control the graph of entanglement? Yes, no, no, no. I, I agree. Yeah. But I think in your plot, you have first one quadrature entangle and then you have another later. So I just think that you can do oh, it. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, so this is 
Oh, I was my son. First, the symmetric mode is entangled. Exactly. Then the anti-symmetric mode is entangled. But later. So later, and that and that requires in between doing this pi rotation on one yeah, of the. Yes, subjects. that's that's what I'm saying. That you can do it the two at the same time. Okay, I think that we need to talk about. I I'm, I'm not understanding okay, it, but okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I think. There... Sorry, maybe I'll just say I, I'm I'm fairly sure one does need the local control, in order. Yeah, in order to control the spatial structure of entanglement between the subsystems. Yes, I mean, you, you right? Tune, tune everything. Yeah, I would so you need these ingredients of the global interactions plus the local control, and there may be more than one way to use those. You do, you do so I think, you're, I think you're saying you could do it right up front yes. instead of partway through. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. that, that's possible, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say in order to make these more complex graphs, you actually also need to be able to do the... Um, Okay, that that I need that I'm not convinced of. I think we need to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Next question. Thank mm -hmm. you, Monica. Uh, I think it was uh, very beautiful. I just have a naive question that relates partly to my talk. Um, when you talk about having all this nice global uh, interaction, including with quadrupole, um, mm -hmm. in one of the systems you mentioned, what can you say about noise mechanisms? Are they also getting to be global collective or to some extent collective? That's a really great question. So actually, um, one of my students, Avatar, was thinking through, mm. through also like, what if you want to use this method to make resources for computation? Right. And you know, what right. would it take to reach an error correction threshold? And mm -hmm. it turns out there's not much analysis of correlated noise in that context. And so he actually thought of a clever way to make sure that the noise becomes mm -hmm. decorrelated. Right. Um, okay. And so it actually requires taking some, for most, the most general graph, it actually involves taking some care to choose the detuning of the drive field from cavity resonance for each pulse in a clever way um, to take out correlations in the I noise. would really love to, um, to So learn it turns out it looks like about, there's a trick for that. Yes, yeah. because, yeah. well. Yeah, um, but it's a really great question. You might yeah. worry that somehow noise is gonna be worse than it would be otherwise correct, with the correlations correct. and you have this collective dissipation, but it looks like there's a way to decorrelate it. Maybe I will ask a reference or some, some more yeah, detail. I'd yeah, love can, to yeah, learn more about yeah. the system. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, more questions? Thanks for the next talk. It wasn't clear to me if you're using the output signal of the cavity and if there's an opportunity if you have high enough quantum efficiency to use the, the yeah. light that leaks oh, out of the that's cavity a great in question. interesting yeah. ways. Yeah. So um, it turns out in our current cavity, um, unfortunately, the mirror finesse is lower than it was meant to be. So the mirrors are lossy and the output signal is, is not that helpful. Um, you know, the good news about that is. Um, if we fix that, we'll have stronger coupling and stronger uh, atom-photon interactions and better outcoupling. Um, but this is one reason why, actually, if we wanted to like measure, do these, um, do this simultaneous sensing of two quadratures. In principle, you could do, if it's just two ensembles, two QND measurements with the cavity to get the sum of the x's and the difference of the p's. Um, and you know, so in a sort of future cavity with better outcoupling, maybe that's the way you should do things, and you could really do continuous QND measurements. Um, which would be quite quite interesting. Um, I would say the bad outcoupling has forced us to rely more on imaging, but um, I think the upside of that is it, we kind of maybe went in some some new directions with really looking at this multi-mode entanglement. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you talked about using these uh, graph states for sensing the, these multipartite entangled states. We know that for sensing only the one and the two body reduced density matrices are relevant. So what do you wish or expect to gain by using these more multipartite entangled states? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the statement about only the one and two body reduced density matrices being relevant, but I would say that um, by generate, so it's clear that having sort of multiple independent entangled states as an example gives you spatial resolution that if you want to maximize um, sensitivity to a particular, um, something like a gradient, then it's valuable to have global entanglement, but, but you know, to sort of flip the spins locally. Um, I gave this example of sensing two non-commuting, uh, uh, perturbations of two non-commuting observables that benefits from the EPR type entanglement. So I think there are a couple of specific examples where we can say that some spatial structure to the entanglement helps. Um, Not beyond the one and two body, because in, in sensing the, the cost function is always quadratic. 
So it can't be that more than second order, or let's say two body reduced density matrices matter. I mean, we have a paper that shows this. I, I think, I'm a little confused because to me that sounds like you're saying that squeezing helps you and higher order correlations don't. Yeah, that is correct. Um, and actually, so there's one question to answer there, but everything I talked about is actually squeezing. It's just squeezing um, various um, combinations of collective modes. It's squeezing with spatial structure. There's a separate question one could ask, which is, does it help if we have non-Gaussian states? Like, you know, is, is a GHZ state ever realistically actually going to help you for sensing? Um, and, you know, in principle, I think there's a direction of making non-Gaussian states with some spatial structure. And um, I'm, I think the question of whether that helps you for sensing is probably one that anyway is beyond the scope of this talk. So, you know, we can talk yeah, about but it I think online. But this was all about squeezing. Okay. And may maybe, maybe other folks in the audience want to <laughs> comment on, you know, the value of non-Gaussian states. I think Peter, for example, has, has work on this. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a, maybe a much more mundane question. How do you actually do these local rotations uh, in yeah. the cavity for like a set um, it's just a It's just Raman addressing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then. Good. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, to be a little more explicit, there's a scanning. We have a, an acousto-optic deflector that can scan a beam. And that beam can do AC start shifts, and it can also do Raman couplings. And so we can do that for any combination of ensembles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful talk. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to understand a little bit how to think about resources yeah. um, in the system. So let's imagine I have, I don't remember the, your number of ensembles, so I'll call it 20. Yeah. Uh, we have 20 ensembles, and I could, um, let's imagine I had a conveyor belt so I could move each ensemble individually into the cavity and create a squeeze state. And then I move it out of the cavity, I move the next ensemble in, I create a squeeze state via this exchange interaction. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do that yeah. 20 times in a row. And then I instead say, no, I'm going to actually leave all the ensembles in there, apply some interactions, do some rotations, apply some interactions, but in the, in, in the end, end up with 20 independently squeezed ensembles. Yeah. Do I get the exact same amount of squeezing? I, I imagine it might. Like it just, I think there's no that hit. the amount of squeezing is the same if yeah. you're from a fundamental, like fundamentally NC, by cavity dissipation. Yeah, exactly. But um, the number of operations you have to do is is smaller, right? It's just n instead of n squared. Um, and so in that sense, it's actually more efficient to use these collective. Uh, collective that's if, approach. sorry, uh, why do I need n squared operations? Oh, if, sorry, if I want to make a general graph where I might Oh, have, general where graph. I, might have I, no, I was just thinking, any, I just wanted to count to yeah. understand the simplest one, which is I want 20 independently squeezed sub ensembles. Oh, sorry, yeah. For the independent squeezing, I, th I think that's right, yeah. And the, so the, this, I would say this starts to get interesting. You know, you can disentangle, but it starts to really get interesting um, for these richer graphs. I, I see, so, so basically I take no hit on my fundamental NC limit associated so the, with squeezing by keeping everything in the cavity. Squeezing, the figure of merit is the co cooperativity per ensemble, and in principle, moving ensembles in and out of the cavity, you would get the same. Is it, is it going, okay, that's really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lorenzo, you want to start setting up? We'll take maybe one or two questions while Lorenzo is getting set up. I think Dan, you had one more. So I was wondering. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy question, but since you have so many operations you can do on so many bits of this, I'm wondering if you have some sense of how close you are to just being able to implement random har unitaries, you know, on on the whole system. So sort so, of like what fraction yeah. of all possible unitaries could you um, implement? One thing that, you know, one thing we've thought about is using these like non-local interactions for scrambling. Um, and there's actually a, a nice paper by Brian Swingle um, that shows that if you have all-to-all -all Ising interactions plus kind of random local rotations, um, then you, you can essentially generate a fact scrambler. And so it's essentially the ingredients we, we have, right? We would do global interactions, local rotations, um, now, we would still not break the symmetry um, of the spins on each site, right? So each ensemble kind of acts like some collective degree of freedom. Um, uh, but yeah, if, you know, so if, if it were a qubit on each site, it would really kind of fully scramble in that, that Hilbert space. In our case, again, each ensemble acts as a collective degree of freedom, but in terms of kind of the correlations between the sites, we can totally grab them. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions for Monica? All right, now let's thank you again. Tonight.